Bearded composers born in 1935, not only Terry Riley, but also Peter Schickley, who's had a distinguished career writing music under his own name, but also promoting the fictitious PDQ Bach, the last and least of Johann Sebastian Bach's sons, and he has written a series of delightful parodies over the years, spanning a time period far beyond the mere late Baroque, early classical, including the late Renaissance parody that you heard in My Bonnie Lass, She Smelleth. You heard the finale, and of course that being a parody of the famous Thomas Morley, My Bonnie Lass, She Smileth. We had some lovely scat singing from the composer himself, who is a Swarthmore College music graduate, indeed the very first from the school, graduated the year of my birth, 1957. Following that, we've heard some amazing music by Lamont Young, and he's really in the crosshairs of where chance music meets minimalism. And as you could see with the scores there at the end, the compositions 1960 plus a few piano pieces for David Tudor and one dedicated to Terry Riley. He really is at the beginning also of what becomes known as performance art. And that composition, 1960, number seven, that perfect fifth of simply B to F sharp to be held for a long time. John Cage eventually does a piece called Aslisp, as slow as possible. And his long time has been very long indeed as well. There it is. Lamont and Terry both became involved with the Fluxus movement in New York. Oh, we forgot to talk about Nam June Pike and Charlotte Moorman and Yoko Ono, who were also involved in Fluxus. Notoriously, Nam June Pike's The Swan, uh, the old Sassau Swan, in which Charlotte Moorman stopped halfway through the performance and then jumped into a tub of water. Also, Pike's. TV bra for living sculpture, which Charlotte Moorman appeared on stage clad in strategically placed television sets. Fluxus was, in a way, an outgrowth of the happening movement that started with Alan Capro back in 1952, and Capro was a student of John Cage. And a close synonym, performance art, in many ways, has roots that go all the way back to the Dada movement in the 1910s. So go figure. But at any rate, lots of exciting things happening. forms a group in 1963, the Theater of Eternal Music, with Marion Zazila, who he marries that year, and also Terry Riley sits in occasionally, and very instrumental are three Johns, two Johns, J-O-N, John Hassel, trumpet, and John Gibson, saxophone, both who had played in Terry's In C, in that seminal 1968 recording, and also John Cale, a violist, who then the next year founds with Lou Reed, the Velvet Underground. Some of the titles of the Theater of the Eternal Music were incredibly long, as were the performances. The longest one was six years from 1979 to 1985. 
in the Harrison Street Gallery. Before that, though, Lamont and Marion establish a Church Street studio, which becomes the Dream House, and from 1966 to 1970, they have an ambient sound drone haunting environment, an alarming environment, uh, which is also a light show, which they also live in, and they ascribe to a 25 or so hour day. That's kind of naturally what humans will default to during maybe summer vacations or shelter in places. But sometimes you call Lamont and at three in the afternoon he'd just be waking up. <laughs> Okay, with Terry, he becomes renowned enough that in 1968, the same year that NC is recorded, Lamont is offered to sing, cue the, there you go, cue the sink, cue the water. He's invited to record one of his pieces, Oceans, in which he sings against an ocean. At the last minute, Columbia decided to switch the ocean against which Lamont sang with another ocean, and he forbade that and withdrew the composition. And from that day to this, Lamont has been much less high profile in the larger world than Terry. Both become students of Pandit Pranath, and you hear from a performance in 1977 in Rome some of their music together, also with Marian. Another composer haunted by the big piano piece that evolved until it finally was performed in 1974 for the first time, and that being the well-tuned piano.
Following that, another kind of minimalism, uh, which we find in so much popular music, this being the one-hit wonder Richard Berry, not to be confused with Chuck Berry and his Louie Louie. And we have our three favorite chords now in G major, one 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 four four five 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 four four, going all the way back to at least Henry Purcell. Yes. <laughs> Following this, another friend of Terry Riley. This is Steve Reich, who introduced the Pulse to NC in 1964. And that same year, he recorded in San Francisco's Union Square a preacher named Brother Walter, who was delivering a sermon on Noah and the Flood. It's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And that it's going to rain becomes a little sample tape loop that... Steve records on several tape recorders, and then he discovered that old analog tape recorders did not necessarily play back exactly at the same speed. Sort of like windshield wipers on the old school bus when they were in independent motors, and eventually they would get in and out of sync. And so slowly the sounds of It's Gonna Rain on the two tape recorders or more tape recorders, eventually more tape recorders becomes more and more out of sync until you get this really ominous array. And he was thinking about the Cuban Missile Crisis that happened in October of 1962. Of course, in C, Ray Riley had gotten back from India in February of 64, was asked to do a piece for the Tape Music Center that all the composers associated would be involved in. They rehearsed it through March. They didn't premiere it, actually, until November. So in C is in the air, and Steve finishes this piece the next year in 1965, and they did have a falling out for a while, feeling that one person's work was too strongly based on another, but Steve really goes his own direction. He's a very precise individual, and we'll see his evolution takes very rational and methodic turn at each step of his fascinating career to date. I interviewed Steve probably sometime in the late 90s, and again, we had a great time, and he became a subscriber to my Journal of New Music, 20th Century Music, for a number of years after that. and always appreciated his support. second half of the tape features tape splices of other sections of Brother Walter's Union Square sermon, which are then cycled and given the same process as before. Again, quite ominous. He began to warn the people. He said, after a while, it's going to rain after a while, for 40 days and for 40 nights. And the people didn't believe him. And they began to laugh at him. And they began to mock him. And they began to say, it ain't going to rain. It's 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 going to rain. My Lord, my Lord. I said until the skin came off their hands, they cried. I could just hear them cry now. I could hear them say, oh, Noah, would you just open the door? But Noah couldn't open the door. It had been sealed by the hand of God. Oh, God, God, it had been sealed. Couldn't open the door. But, oh, Noah, they cried. Could you just open the door. Couldn't open the door. But show sure now, hallelujah. Oh, God, God, it had been sealed. Couldn't open the door. But, oh, Noah, they cried. Could you just open the door. Couldn't open the door. But show sure now, hallelujah. Oh, it is God, God. <laughs> <laughs> 